it was a uh, it was about two hours after midnight that I parked my car uh, behind some trees and some bushes. Uh, I parked it there because I didn't want it to, to be seen uh, from the main road. And as I made my way uh, to my friends who were waiting for me a little further down in the forest, uh, I saw a car pass by on the main road. Now, cars and roads uh, go very well together, so nothing really was going on until a second one passed, quickly followed by a third. And at this moment, I became a little bit alerted because uh, we were in there in the middle of the night. It was rural Denmark. Uh, society was asleep, uh, which we wanted to use in our advantage. So when the fourth car passed, it backed up and it shone its headlights onto my car and onto the street where, uh, where we couldn't be seen up till then. Uh, I quickly ran into the forest and hid behind a tree. <coughs> and as I saw that light shine on my car and shine on my friends a little behind it, I, 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 still, I can still see that image, uh, image today. I saw this fully uh, dressed, camouflaged type of guy with a big German dog on a, on a leash running towards my friends. And it wasn't uh, until a few minutes later that I was laying handcuffed uh, on the forest floor and I was, I was thinking, there was this sentence that, went, that, that kept going through my mind, my mom and dad are going to find out about this. And I don't think that they're going to like it. Um, this was a bit of the, on the top of my activist day. When I finished school, uh, I studied cultural history. And when I finished my education, I became a marketeer for the animals. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, late 90s, it was called an animal rights activist. And I took my opinion to the streets. I took my opinion to the streets because I thought it was an important thing. First videos that I saw about how humans treat animals, I couldn't really grasp it. And uh, when I met like-minded people, we soon agreed that we had to do something about it. Now, I got arrested for an attempted liberation of these little animals. They're called mink. Um, and people use them to warm their bodies when it's really cold, which is really a good idea if you're an Eskimo living 400 years ago, but not in the 21st century. I was sentenced to six months in prison, and so were my friends. Um, I, spend, I spent it in the winter of 2000. Um, and I'm actually not here to tell you about uh, my time in prison, nor am I here to tell you about whether I think it's wrong to hold animals in cages. Now, I'm here to tell you about two things that came in my mind when I was in prison. The first one was, I will never get arrested again. And the second one was, I need to find a new way, a, a new level of helping out animals. Well, I became a documentary, documentary filmmaker when I, uh, when I freed. I have to uh, fast forward a few years. Uh, and I was uh, very lucky to travel the world uh, doing that job. I visited um, Sudan, where the people had just been living under 40 years of, of civil war. I visited the Gaza Strip three times, and I filmed for an organization there helping out handicapped people, war victims. And I visited beautiful places like Burma, where I uh, met up with Buddhist culture, and I, I, I got into meditation. I became a filmmaker because I actually, in that activist scene, I saw a lot of good ideas, only, uh, as you've seen my own picture here, you know, we were a little bit, we were not really in tune with how to, how to bring these ideas to the public. That's why you see me with a big megaphone and a balaclava over my head. Until I met Lisette Kreischer. She's a good friend of mine. Uh, and I was looking for, for, for a new way of, of making a film about animals, because in the back of my mind, during all my travels, I always thought of this one idea. How can I make a film that tells about, that shows about how we can move away from using animals for whatever reason, um, without using all the images that, that everybody here have seen, that we all know? Well, I met Lisette, and Lisette basically came from the same background that I came from. Uh, only Lisette was using it uh, in a totally different way. She was using food as a way to inspire people to eat plant-based food. So, Lisette is a master, she's a true master, I have to admit, because all these pies and all these cupcakes and all her food is basically made without using any animal ingredients. That means no dairy, no meat, no fish. And I've been living as a vegan for over eight years uh, since the first video that I, that I, see, that I saw about animals. Uh, and it's quite a hard thing to make food that nice. But I really liked her approach, and, and Lisette and I had a, had a very good click, and we thought about, we're going to make a film about this. Um, we're going to make a film about how we, how we can move away from animals towards a more plant-based lifestyle. And although uh, 
what I'm going to tell you about is a positive story, I have to say a few things that, that maybe we don't want to hear. They're inconvenient truths, but the meat and dairy industry, as, as, as they are today, have become the biggest threat to the near future uh, food security. We've had a World War II. We, there was people dying in Amsterdam from hunger. And when the war finished, um, the government thought, we, will never, we, we want to eradicate hunger from this world. We want to eradicate hunger from the Netherlands, which I totally support. And we did this, one of the things we did this by is taking animal farming into animal industry. And it worked, and it worked for over 60 years, only now we have to move forward. Um, and I'm going to tell you the way we can move forward. The way to move forward is, is called green proteins. You can remember that. Green proteins and plant-based food. Because when we were talking about making this film, we, we quickly decided it had to be about food. But, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're into vegetarian food and you want to try it out, I always hear people say, yes, but how do I get my proteins? How do I get my calcium? How do I get my iron? Well, Professor Brandenburg, uh, a guy we met, he's a professor at the University of Wageningen. He'd done experiments on plant-based proteins for over years, and he came up with a solution, basically, to this, to this protein quest, which is in seaweed, seaweed cultivation. Now, a lot of times, scientists think of things, think of new ideas, but they don't know how to bring it to the market. They don't really know how to bring it into the, to the large audience. And this question, um, how will this future taste? How will the future taste? How will this future food taste? This is what, what became the, 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 leading, uh, the leading idea of our film. So Lisette and I, we took some samples of the professor and we went to New York because in New York, something really cool is going on. Um, there are uh, over 40 to 50 restaurants that are all vegan. Vegan is 100% uh, vegetarian. They're all vegan, they make everything that we know, uh, for example, donuts, scones, um, pizzerias. We've, we've been to all those places, we've done a lot of testing, um, and a lot of chefs, they were already using seaweed in, for example, soups or salads, but you know, we were really looking for something that at least had a, had a little bit of, of sort of masculine power. It had, had a good bite. One of the top restaurants in, in New York had this dish on their menu, and the funny thing was that when people go to that restaurant, nowhere you can, you can see it's vegetarian food. They don't write it on the window. Uh, they don't even write it on the menu. It's just, yeah, they think of these, of these new names, right? So people go there, um, and they order. This, this, was their, uh, this, this was their flagship dish. And the, the manager told me that when people leave their restaurant, they always write, ah, oh, this was the best veal that I've ever had. Actually, and this is made of wheat gluten, right? So this, here you have a 100% plant-based product. And, uh, yeah, and people were thinking it was meat, you know? And if you, if you talk about veal or lamb meat, because that was the other one that they were referring to, th these are pretty, you know, these are people who, who have their taste buds uh, pretty high developed. So we, we sort of knew it had to have a good bite, right? So we, we went on and on in our quest, and then we met, we met uh, Jeff. Jeff was uh, running a fast food restaurant in uh, Brooklyn. And if you look at him, you know, he was the, your typical masculine, you know, meat eater type of guy. You know, he'd probably brush teeth with, uh, with blood if he, uh, if he could, you know. But Jeff, he was, uh, he was a very friendly guy, actually. He was a vegan biker. Uh, and he told me, everything that flies, crawls, swims, or walks, I'm not eating it, and I'm not serving it. So we really, we really liked, you know, that, that we thought, if, if, if we talk to Jeff, you know, we should listen to this guy. We should, we should listen to his approach of these things. Um, and one of the things Jeff had on his menu was uh, the vegan heart attack burger. Now, the chance that you have a, have a heart attack eating vegan food is pretty small. Um, but we, we really like the name, you know, because you get, you get a little bit enticed uh, by, using, uh, by using this word. So we took his burger and we tried it out. And uh, we met these other guys. They, were, they had a food truck in New York. Uh, also all vegan and organic, uh, and they made for us a special of the day. Uh, and since we had to have a name, we couldn't call it the vegetarian seaweed burger, you know, that would, all the New Yorkers would probably pass by. So we thought, oh, we call it the Dutch weed burger, since obviously we're known for our weed culture. And that maybe attract uh, the attention of New Yorkers, you know, and, and if we're lucky, Lisette will get arrested, you know. I, I could see the New York Times headline, Dutch guys arrested selling weed burgers. 
which didn't happen, unfortunately, or fortunately. Uh, and the reactions were really good. Reactions were so good that when, I, when we went back to the Netherlands and I went into the editing room editing my video, um, a few parallel worlds collided because down south in Zeeland, in the province of Zeeland, in the Jacobenhaven, two ladies had actually started a seaweed farm. A very small scale, though, but they were able to produce uh, seaweed. And when I was editing, Lisette was uh, checking her emails, and people were asking, "Wow, where can we try your Dutch? Where can we try your weed burger?" So when this question uh, when this question came to us, uh, we talked to um, we talked to the ladies who are in their first year, still you know floating their canoe and picking it uh, picking it by hand in the pink uh, bucket. We bought some some of that seaweed. We came together with a chef, and we created uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, we created this, yeah. So we, we'd been using chlorella, which is a microalgae. Uh, we, we use that in the bread, so it's a little bit green. We had a burger, which uh, got a really good bite, but we put uh, seaweed in it. And we basically thought, we have to make something that, you know, people, if we wouldn't tell them, they wouldn't even know that we, we changed something. So we, we just take out the animal proteins, we put in green, uh, green proteins uh, made from plants and made from seaweed. Um, and the big challenge was, you know, how can we, because we were wishful thinkers, we think it, if it works in a negative way, it can also work in a positive way. We thought, okay, but now we have to make this big step. How can we uh, attract, how can we attract people to actually buy uh, or actually taste our burger, you know? So we went to this festival. Uh, we got an old uh, double-decker, as you can see. We made a restaurant in it. And when the gates opened, you know, we had to... Uh, get in contact with the guys like these. Well, how do you do that? Uh, it's a little bit hard, but since you know, our burger was so full of proteins, we, we, we were like, how, do you, how, how can we do it? So we started dealing proteins to these guys. Now, you know, this guy's a bodybuilder, obvi obviously using it when he's training it. So when we was like, you wanna buy some proteins? <laughs> and they came up to us, yeah, yeah, yeah good, good, good. <laughs> so he was, he was trying it, that's what's good. And then we met guys like these, you know, they were like a bit like, oh, a bit, a bit reluctant to trying it out. And then we were like, ah, you're wearing this Popeye t-shirt. Well, if Popeye would still be cartooning, he'd probably be eating seaweed instead of spinach. And then he was like, oh, yeah, you think so? You think so? <laughs> and he was trying it as well. So here we were, you know, we were, we were propagating uh, a change in our food culture because this is really what's going on. And it can be pretty hard too, you know, because a lot of people, they don't even think about it. They think like, ah, oh, vegetarian food. Oh, no, I'm not a vegetarian, so I can't eat vegetarian food. So when people come up to us and they say, is it vegetarian? We, we sometimes we say, well, it's also vegetarian, but it's actually for meat eaters. And then these people, they go like, ah, oh, OK, then I'll have one. You know, it's, it's really a thing. I think a lot of these things, it's just stuck in our minds. And um, yeah, up to this day, we're still propagating, uh, we're still propagating seaweed. Uh, it's going rather well. Uh, which is a good thing because, you know, we have a big challenge, uh, a big challenge in front of us. Um, because we believe, and, and where I come from and where Lisette comes from, we believe that, you know, we only have one planet. And they say uh, if the population grow, uh, grows, we have to find three extra planets. Now, you know, I don't want to put all my trust in NASA actually finding these planets. And then what are we going to do? Send like millions and millions of cows and pigs and... You know, or are we gonna are, are we gonna think this through? This this 60 year old 60 year old idea, you know, of eradicating hunger. I believe we can still eradicate hunger in this world if we switch to green proteins. If we switch to a plant-based diet. For yeah, let let me be clear on this. Uh, humans, we need animals. I mean, animals don't need us. We need the animals. We need the worms in the ground, and we need the bees in the sky. And this is you know this is this is an ecosystem that we're living in. Same as the planet. The planet doesn't need us. They don't need humans. But we, we need the planet. This is our life support system. And we only have one of it. And, and I think if you talk about momentum, you know, we're all young adults here. And it'll be on our watch that we will either see this planet get destroyed or get restored if we, you know, if we make good choices right now. Um, and I already said it, and I'm going to say it one more time. Green proteins is a very, very, very good new idea to adopt. And it's a very easy one, too, because every time you pick up your knife and fork, you do that three times a day, right? Think about it. Whenever, you're, whenever the next time is, you, try, you have to choose what kind of food you eat. All right, thank you.